it's great to uh, see you again. Welcome to the second um, of our events of the uh, academic year. We actually snuck one in at the end of August uh, where we had a workshop. Um, we have two more exciting um, sessions planned for the fall. Uh, we have Eric Cavallero, who is um, a philosopher from um, Southern Connecticut State University who is one of the um, leading figures in global democracy theory and transnational democracy theory. And he'll be presenting um, a talk on secession and uh, territorial right. And that should be very interesting. Um, that will be on November 19th at uh, 6.30. And will be co-sponsored by the SPP group, which you might be interested to know about. That's the group in social and political philosophy uh, here at the Graduate Center made up of, with, with the leadership of some graduate students and uh, participation of some faculty. And you're all invited to be on that mailing list as well. Uh, so, and then we're having um, on December 5th a very interesting conference on various uh, mini session actually, but three speakers on various aspects of participation. Uh, participatory approaches to democracy. Um, and in, we're having a speaker from Michigan State University who's uh, speaking about indigenous peoples and participation. And then one, another one is on participatory budgeting, um, which is a process that began in Brazil and is currently being used in New York. And the next mayor has signed on to advancing participatory budgeting in a big way. Um, the next mayor, assuming it's de Blasio, of course. Um, and, um, and then a third talk will be on worker management uh, and worker, uh, workplace democracy um, by someone from Brooklyn College and political science. So that should be a very interesting session on Thursday afternoon, December 5th. Today, I'm just delighted to have um, a speaker whom we've brought from Canada, the um, one of the leaders of the um, uh, using care ethics to um, apply to international affairs, which is very much in need of care <laughs> as well as care ethics. Um, and uh, it's Fiona Robinson, as you know. Uh, we're also joined today by another leading care ethicist, Virginia Held. So we have actually two of the foremost theorists of care ethics right here in the room today. And I'm very delighted about that. Um, Fiona has, is professor of political science at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. And she's the author of um, uh, Globalizing Care, Ethics, Feminist Theory, and International Relations from 1999, which was a very early uh, look relatively to the development of care ethics at how uh, feminist care ethics could apply to international relations. And then uh, she's followed it up um, with other um, many articles and a co-edited book, but also a, um, a very exciting book called The Ethics of Care, A Feminist Approach to Human Security, which was recently published in the book series on global ethics and politics of Temple University Press, which I have the honor of editing. and. Um, it has also uh, was shortlisted for the International Relations Book Prize by the Canadian Political Science Association, which is truly miraculous because apparently the prize committee was made up of standard I international relations theorists who, who are in general not sympathetic to care ethics and all men. So they're recognizing excellence where it exists. So uh, today, um, Fiona Robinson has, um, will be talking about the topic, Rethinking Human Security Through the Lens of Care. Before I bring her up, I just want to let you know that you're all invited to our splendid, uh, renowned reception to follow with fine wine and cheese and other goodies, hummus, other all kinds of nice vegetarian, vegan things if you want, in, uh, which will be in our usual place in the globalization seminar room to follow. But before then, we're going to have the, the talk and then opportunity for discussion. So please join. 5109. It's the Globalization Seminar Room. And we'll all be going down there. You can just sort of follow along. But in case you get lost, that's, that's where you need to end up. 
And so please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Fiona Robinson. Oh, is that yours, Carol? Or is that that? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for having me. I, I wanted to start by, by thanking Carol. Um, actually, I have a lot to thank her for. So if I thank her for everything, I'll take too long. Um, I want to thank her for the invitation, um, for the, the book series, uh, and for the Center uh, for Global Ethics and Politics, and for all the support and advice that she gave me on the book. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to try and end before 7.30, so we have some time for, for discussion. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do today is, uh, as Carol said, to, to talk about the 2011 book, um, The Ethics of Care, um, A Feminist Approach to Human Security. Uh, so first what I'll do is give you some background on where the ideas for this book uh, came from and why I chose to write it. Uh, then I will say a little bit uh, about some of the major arguments and ideas in the book, uh, focusing particularly on the idea of human security um, and, and what the ethics of care can bring to this idea or how we can re rethink this idea through the lens of, of care ethics. Um, and then maybe if time permits, I'll say a bit about how my thinking has developed since writing the book, uh, but I'll, I'll see how I'm going for time. All right, so in terms of the background, I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I actually remember very clearly and specifically where I was and what I was doing when I had the idea to write this book. Um, I was sitting in an exam uh, that my students were writing. They were writing uh, an exam on my course, The Politics of Human Rights. And I was reading an article called We the Peoples, Contending Discourses of Security in Human Rights Theory and Practice. Now that article argued for the indivisibility of security and human rights. Uh, using the language of human security, the authors of that article argued that there can be no security for the individual if his right to life is being threatened by his government or if he is being denied rights to subsistence. The authors in that article call for a cosmopolitan moral awareness such that we, quote, come to empathize with and respond to the sacrifices made by those fighting for basic rights in repressive regimes. They concluded their article by claiming, by claiming that they have, in their inquiry, put the victims of global politics at the center of academic inquiry. And they refer to the responsibility to rescue those trapped uh, in situations of violence, poverty, and ill health. So I read this article and I found it very frustrating. Uh, yet I also found that it confirmed a lot of my knowledge about the human security paradigm. Uh, that it was very rights oriented. In fact, that it was very difficult to distinguish between human rights and human security. That they were almost synonymous in the literature. Uh, that human security was very liberal individualist and very liberal internationalist uh, in its orientation. That it didn't seem to pay attention to gender in a critical way, uh, but that its assumptions were themselves deeply gendered. And that it sought to apply a kind of rationalist, idealist ethics to the problem of insecurity. And, and the, all of these things to me seemed to be things that needed to be addressed. Uh, so, having already written uh, a book and a number of articles critiquing conventional liberal understandings of human rights and outlining the place of care in international political theory, I naturally began to think about how I would critique this article and indeed human security in general from the position of feminist care ethics. Now, although I had been teaching and researching in the area of IR theory, uh, ethics and IR and gender and IR for some time at this point, I had never written about security before. Uh, in fact, I had never really considered it as a topic for me. Um, security uh, was for the kind of guns and bombs people, right, of IR. That's, that's the way uh, I considered it. It was for realists and other kind of hard positivists. Uh, I was interested in ethics, gender, and human rights. But as I thought about it more, I began to realize that thinking about security and care ethics might actually be a good idea, since security has traditionally been seen as the real nuts and bolts of IR. It is also traditionally understood in very masculinist and positivist terms. 
In other words, gender and ethics are traditionally seen to have nothing to do with security. That said, I was also aware of a growing critical security studies literature, which incorporated ideas of ethics, gender, discourse, and power. So this seemed like a good jumping off point uh, for my ideas. But as far as I was aware at that time, there had been no work which sought to explicitly link, uh, in both conceptual and practical terms, the ethics of care with the idea of human security. Certainly, I think it's worth saying that there has been and continues to be a lot of great work on gender and security, feminist security studies, and even gender uh, and human security. Uh, I remember being particularly taken with a passage that I read in a great book, which is called Engendering Human Security, um, edited by a number of, of authors. Um, and they write uh, in, that, in that book, Quote, the human security approach has yet to free itself from the regnant tendency in neoliberal reforms, which tend to apply primarily male norms in valuing and regulating social life, obliterating the significance of arrangements which provide care for the young, sick, and elderly. For all the pronouncements about women, children, and the elderly as social groups vulnerable to human security threat, the global reality tells another story and brings home the message that these tendencies may reflect a deep crisis in care systems worldwide. So I thought this is an idea that needs to be developed. So in 2009, I started to write about what the concept of security would look like if we saw it through the lens of care ethics. Uh, I remember I gave a paper on this very early on uh, at a Canadian Political Science Association conference. Uh, and in the audience were a few colleagues from the university across the river in Ottawa, which is the University of Ottawa. Uh, and they were very critical of the whole idea of human security. Um, they themselves were more critical in a kind of post-structuralist, Foucauldian kind of way, writing about securitization and security practices as a form of governmentality. So they listened to my paper and they advised me to drop the idea of human security. They told me that the idea is dead. Um, they said it's been subject to too much criticism. It can't be resuscitated. Uh, they said, just write about care ethics. Uh, don't use care as a basis for understanding human security. So I didn't listen. Uh, <laughs> I listened, and then I ignored. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit about why I did um, later on. OK, so that's a bit of background. Um, and uh, now I'll go on to talk a bit about the main themes and, and arguments of the book. What I wanted to do in the book is to show how the ethics of care can offer an alternative normative and conceptual basis for the idea of human security. And in so doing, could revitalize an idea that had a lot of potential, but had almost dropped off the radar of both academics and policymakers. In so doing, I wanted to allow people to think differently, not only about security, but also about care. I sought to make three arguments in the book. First, that the human in human security could not be understood as an autonomous, atomistic, atomized individual. Uh, the human subjects of security must be in, understood as existing within networks of, rela of relations, of responsibility, and care. And this is not you know, a new argument. Um, Carol makes this argument, Virginia. It's, it's not a new argument, but I, I, I thought that in the context of security, it really seemed to be completely missed. No one had even said anything about it. Uh, secondly, I wanted to argue that efforts to enhance human security must recognize the importance of networks of responsibility and care in determining people's everyday experiences of security and insecurity. So in other words, the way people actually experience their security or the lack of it depends upon the relations of care that are around them or not, right? That, and that I, that has to do with food, shelter, um, physical security, et cetera. And third, an, an approach to human security based on feminist care ethics ch challenges assumptions about dependency and vulnerability in world politics. By reading care discourses and practices through historical and contemporary relations of domination and exclusion. This might be the most important 
argument in the book, but it might be the least well-developed one, I think, now when I look back at the book. Um, but what I was trying to do was really distance uh, my approach from a kind of liberal internationalist approach to human security, um, which I saw as following a very particular understanding or a particular approach to uh, conceptualizing who are the victims, right? The, that, that, that we in the global north need to protect the security, the human security of, of those vulnerable, dependent people in the global south. And I, I wanted to challenge that dichotomy through care ethics. So I sought to challenge, uh, in particular, the reading of women and children, developing countries, and the poor as dependent or vulnerable. Instead, my approach sought to recognize the diversity and agency of these individuals and groups and to recognize the extent to which we in income-rich countries are increasingly dependent on the labor of these groups that meet our care needs. Um, and also, of course, to show that, that all human beings are vulnerable and dependent uh, at different, in different, to different degrees and, and at different times in their lives. So my arguments rest on the claims that well-being for people is achieved and sustained largely through relations and activities of care, and that in the absence of these relations, or where they are deficient or disrupted, well-being and security are threatened. Children, the infirm, elderly, the chronically ill and disabled all require continuous care to support their lives. So situations of violent conflict, environmental contamination or disaster, or health pandemics create a massive and immediate increase in care needs for families, communities, and in some cases, uh, entire societies or even nation states. Physical and psychological injury, lack of access to adequate shelter, food, and clean water, providing for the needs caused by these harms all depend upon uh, practices of care. The extent of these needs are exacerbated by the contemporary conditions of neoliberal globalization, which have witnessed, especially in income-poor countries, uh, a gradual erosion of state services and public support for health, education, and child care. Inequalities in the giving and receiving of care are further exacerbated by contemporary patterns of migration and trafficking of women for intimate labor. These counter geographies of globalization, as Saskia Sassen has called them, are built on the backs of poor women of color and support what Chang and Lin call the glitzy internet surfing world of global finance, trade, and communications. While the politics of care and its effect on human security are clearly rooted in the material conditions of the global political economy, this cannot be separated from ideological and discursive understandings of the value and role of practices of care and care work in societies. I argue that in order to understand the devaluing of care and care work, the lack of attention to care arrangements, the exploitation of care workers, and the neglect of those most in need of care around the world, we must pay attention to the role of constructions of masculinity and femininity in various different contexts. Hegemonic masculinities, or what Nancy Fraser has called cultural sexism, are crucial to understanding the politics of human security, not just in terms of their links to militarism, although this is no small thing, um, but at a deeper level in terms of their normalization of existing patterns and distributions of care and their legitimization of men's absence from caring roles. Okay, so that's kind of a, an overview of some of the main arguments. Um, now I'll backtrack a little just to um, examine some of the main ideas a little bit more closely. First, uh, just a bit about human security. Human security is an idea that emerged uh, in the early 1990s uh, through an, a kind of unusual confluence of historical, academic, and policy developments. There was a right time and a right place, I guess, for the idea of human security to emerge. Central to uh, human security is the idea, uh, in its original formulation, uh, that the individual must be the primary referent and beneficiary of security policy and security analyses. So most formulations of human security emphasize the welfare of ordinary people. 
In addition, uh, most conceptions are united in their rejection of the state centrism of dominant realist approaches to security and international relations. Uh, so the term human security has been developed as an idea that can be contrasted with national security uh, and that can direct attention to an emerging and wider spectrum of security issues. Um, I have a little bit about here about the kind of origins of human security in terms of the it first being mentioned in the 1994 UN Human Development Report called New Dimensions of Human Security. Um, and there, it continues on, this, this particular report offered a vision of security focused on individuals and groups rather than states, as I've said, and encompassed the dual goals, goals of freedom from fear and freedom from want. Um, and then it developed uh, to uh, a 2003 report called Human Security Now, uh, which focused again on people as the main stakeholders in ensuring security. In the academic field of international relations, research on human security has uh, proliferated since that time. Um, while much work has tried to develop the concept, there have also been uh, a number of critiques leveled at the idea of human security, um, revolving around its kind of conceptual fuzziness, uh, the idea that it's, it's trying to stretch security too much so that it means everything and therefore nothing, um, and it's kind of normative idealism. Right? This has been a criticism as well. I think, t in my mind, a more damning criticism is that human security is an idea that can end up reinforcing rather than challenging existing relations of power in world politics. Uh, it's often suggested that, uh, as I said at the beginning, that human security is inherently tied to liberal visions of good governance uh, or neoliberal strategies of governance or governmentality. On these views, rather than representing a radical shift, human security has, in fact, provided a justification for the use of traditional security practices, including military intervention, in the name of some sort of higher moral purposes. So in other words, uh, people argue that really it's not that different from understanding security on realist terms. It's just that now we can say we're doing it for human rights um, when in fact, it, rather than state interests, which a realist would say. Um, as I mentioned before, critical security studies in the Foucauldian tradition take a kind of sociological approach to security, seeing security less as a normatively good condition to be achieved and more as a method or strategy through which dominant groups justify and impose a program by assessing who needs to be protected and who needs uh, to be designated as an object of fear, control, coercion, etc. Human security on this view is an exercise of biopower. Uh, the poor and the vulnerable are constructed as those whose biological existence becomes an object of policy uh, and practice. As I wrote in the book, um, I'm actually highly sympathetic to these critiques, um, but I'm also aware that in their focus on, focus on the practices of, of security, um, uh, emanating from so-called security professionals, uh, like border security agencies, police, etc. These critical approaches are relatively uninterested in the voices that are silenced or acted upon. Thus, they effectively remove agency from the objects of security or securitization. Furthermore, I'm also not inclined to be satisfied with the implication of this kind of analysis that there's no possibility of reappropriating the term, uh, even a very problematic term like security, and redeploying it uh, in, different, in a different context. So it's within this spirit of the critical literature on security uh, that I address what human security might mean and how it might be reappropriated as a kind of a critical or counter-hegemonic discourse. And I think that feminist security studies has already begun this task, um, so I am indebted to them as well. I'll just say a little bit about gender, feminism, and human security. Um, not surprisingly, feminists have generally welcomed the human security approach. Uh, in theoretical terms, the source of the alliance, I think, is evident. Both feminist security studies and human security reject uh, what I've called the dominant real estate-centric approach to national security, uh, which privileged the security of the state from the threat of external violence. 
both argue, so both meaning feminist security studies and human security approaches, that the dominant approaches ignore the causes of human insecurity, including those uh, caused by economic, environmental, and social threats, the source of which may come from within the state, and indeed may be the state itself. Um, uh, okay. In spite of these shared commitments, um, however, feminists have been quick to point out the gender blindness in the theory of human security. Um, it's been suggested that, in spite of the broad and inclusive nature of the human security approach, the gender dimensions tend to be overlooked. Uh, so prominent scholars and activists like uh, Charlotte Bunch and Mary Robinson have argued that uh, they seem to be having a good time in there. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh -huh. It's no, no, no. No. Sorry. Do you want me to keep going, Carol? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so Charlotte Bunch and Mary Robinson have argued that the human rights focus of human security is to be welcomed, as long as a feminist human rights lens is used in order to foreground particular threats to the security faced by women. Uh, so uh, they both argue that there are multiple risks faced by women, including uh, poverty, lack of property and reproductive rights, uh, political exclusion. And they both highlight the particular problem of violence against women. Indeed, Charlotte Bunch argues that there is no better paradigm for human security than violence against women, which affects vast numbers of women and can feed acceptance of violence as an inevitable and normal means of dealing with differences. So she argues that uh, women should be taken up in this human security dialogue as a subject or constituency in order that we can address issues that predominantly affect women. So again, I'm obviously I'm very sympathetic to this as well, but I, in the book I question a couple of things about this approach. Um, first, while a bunch refers to her argument as feminist, I think that the focus on women as a constituency or group of individual women sets up women in opposition to men, maintaining the kind of dichotomous logic that many feminists would rather overcome. The focus on women, moreover, can only ever provide a partial conceptualization of human security, one which is only relevant to women. In addition, I argue that the continued reliance on individual human rights, right, so they just want to keep with the human rights, but they just want to use a feminist human rights lens, focus on women's human rights, uh, may be problematic if the goal is to understand how people actually experience threats to their security and what kinds of policy measures could help to achieve security for some of the world's uh, most vulnerable people. So I suggest that rather than just trying to bring in gender, like add gender or add women and stir, or make human security more gender sensitive, we should have a whole new normative framework on which to build the concept of human security. Um, so an ethics of care approach to me uh, doesn't lead simply to the, in, to the addition of a new human security issue, uh, but rather uh, leads to the rethinking uh, of both the meaning of and the ways of achieve, achieving human security, uh, not just for women, but for all people. I argue uh, not only that relations of care at the level of the household and the local community are crucial to the maintenance of adequate levels of human security, but also that material and ideational relations and norms surrounding the practices and values of care constitute the wider structural context that will determine uh, aspects of insecurity for people around the world. Okay, I guess I better say a bit more about the ethics of care before time runs out. Um, you, I think probably most people in this room know about the ethics of care, um, and you will probably know that while accounts uh, of the nature of the ethics of care differ, it is possible to isolate a number of key attributes of the substance of care ethics. I always use Virginia Held's very succinct and clear statement when people ask me what it is. I probably don't get it right word for word, but she has uh, written that the ethics of care um, uh, are, uh, deals with or addresses the compelling moral salience of attending to and meeting the needs of particular others for whom we take responsibility. 
Uh, other uh, approaches, uh, Joan Tronto's now well-known formulation highlights the importance of care ethics, uh, not of moral principles as such, but as practices constitutive of morality. These practices include attentiveness, responsibility, nurturance, compassion, and meeting others' needs. And while there is kind of widespread agreement uh, among feminist ethicists regarding the substantive characteristics of care, there is kind of less agreement regarding epistemological and methodological questions in care ethics. I think there are some differences in terms of epistemology and the nature and status of moral judgments in the ethics of care and the form of care ethics and the methods of moral inquiry that arise uh, from a feminist ethics of care. My approach to care ethics, um, I like to think of it as a critical theory. The ethics of care becomes critical, I argue, when it is committing, committed to looking at, uh, as Margaret Walker has said, where moral views are socially cited and what relations of authority and power hold them in place. This view sees moral judgment uh, in the rationalist tradition as inherently tied to worldly power and privilege. As Kim Hutchings has argued, the dispositional relation between the moral theorist, including the international political theorist, and those on behalf of whom she speaks often takes one of three forms, protective, educative, or punitive. Thus, moral judgment often ends up reproducing existing hierarchies rather than challenging them. A critical lens for care ethics exposes the ways in which traditional justice-based reasoning found in impartialist modes of Kantian rights-based or contractualist uh, moral theory tend to reproduce existing moral hierarchies in this way. Care ethics, I think, can be employed as a critical theory which exposes this, as well as the way that dominant norms and discourses sustain existing power relations that lead to inequalities in the ways in which societies determine how and on what bases care will be given and received. In this way, my view distances, distances itself uh, from what uh, Cooper calls normative or idealized care scholarship. Um, while early feminist scholarship on the ethics of care provided a solid basis for critiquing traditional moral philosophy and rethinking the substance of morality, um, my, my view, in contrast, uh, uh, sees that the ethics of care is primarily concerned with making an ontological claim, as Hutchings writes, a claim about the nature of the world we inhabit rather than a claim about what ought to be the case. That said, I don't think what I'm doing here is wholly non-normative. I think that in making that shift, one that allows us to see moral subjects as relational and to recognize ethics uh, as fulfilling responsibilities through practices of care, just in looking at the care, we reveal new possibilities for how to ensure that those responsibilities can be fulfilled in a manner that minimizes exclusion and suffering. Hence, claims about what ought to be the case are never abandoned entirely. But these claims cannot be judged or justified according to some transcendent or external standpoint. Rather, they are always context dependent and always subject to revision and reconfirmation. As Selma Sevenhuisen has argued, the moral agent in an ethics of care stands with both feet in the real world. This is in contrast to the ideal moral agent of rationalist ethics, which must abstract from specific circumstances in order to achieve responsible moral judgment. But she argues situatedness in concrete social practices need not be seen as a threat to independent judgment. Indeed, the ethics of care uh, demands reflection on the best course of action in specific circumstances. Uh, okay, I'm just a little conscious of time. Um, I'm fine, okay. Uh, although I do strongly defend care ethics as a feminist theory, it is, as I said earlier, not an account of women's morality. Uh, while it does reflect on the neglected values of care, it doesn't valorize caring, nor assume that only women can or should care. On the contrary, it presents responsibilities and practices of care as the substance of morality and argues that the prevalence of women in widely undervalued caring positions is a social construction rather than a natural feature of femininity. 
Politically, it seeks solutions to the problems of giving and receiving care that are non-exploitative, more equitable, and adequate to ensure the flourishing of all persons. Looking through the lens of the ethics of care, I think we see the question of the primary referent or reference of security in a new light. A critical ethics of care disrupts and challenges the dichotomy between the individual and the collective um, that we see a lot in a lot of things, <laughs> political theory, IR theory. Um, uh, what becomes important then is not articulating whether it should be individuals or communities or ethnic groups or states or the whole world, which should be the referent of security. Rather, the key is the argument that all human beings exist at a fundamental level in relation to others. So this is not a superficial uh, empirical claim that we all have connections, which one often re reads when reading about globalization, for example. Um, on the contrary, it is a philosophical claim about the cons constitution of subjectivity through relations. In security terms, it means that we cannot simply look at entities as if they are preformed and autonomous. Individuals exist in relation to other individuals and groups, and these relations are subject, subject to change, um, and they are saturated with different forms and levels of power. Women, men, and children exist in different relationships in all societies, which frame their experiences of insecurity. Different races and ethnic groups exist in relationships in the context of households, communities, states, and at the global level. Relations among states and their constituent groups in the global political economy are characterized by webs of dependence and interdependence, increasingly in ways that defy dominant discourses of dependency in world politics. Indeed, all of these relations are partially constituted by dominant discourses of gender, race, and class at a variety of scales. Yet the implications of these relations for security uh, are material and affect embodied subjects in profound ways. Relationships determine how scarce resources, including food, are distributed within a household, as well as who is responsible for growing or purchasing or preparing food. Relationships determine who takes up arms in political conflicts and who receives crucial medication and care in conditions of scarcity of resources and time. For example, when we examine the effects of environmental disasters, floods, earthquakes, earthquakes hurricanes, and tsunamis, we may recognize the natural cause, but we must also understand their social and political significance. The World Health Organization reports that women and children are particularly affected by disasters, accounting for more than 75% of displaced persons. Uh, as in the case of war, gender roles dictate that women become the primary caretakers for those affected by disasters, substantially increasing their emotional and material workload. In addition to the general effects of natural disasters and lack of health care, women Women are vulnerable to reproductive and sexual health problems and increased rates of sex, sexual and domestic violence. This situation uh, in, in this kind of context uh, uh, mirrors that of violent conflict, where increased gender-based and sexual violence are accompaniments to rising poverty and the collapse of social safety net nets. A similar mix of unimaginable uh, of an unimaginable burden of care with poverty and the potential for violence can be seen in the context of global uh, HIV and AIDS. The threat to human security posed by HIV AIDS does not stop with the individuals who are ill uh, and die, but extends to their families and communities. Of the important challenges raised by the pandemic, moreover, those related to care and care work uh, have been most consistently overlooked. As Jody Heyman argues, one of the most important challenges is how to raise healthy children while at the same time addressing the needs of those adults and children uh, already infected. In a study conducted in Botswana, Heyman found that in the absence of adequate childcare for HIV infected children when they become sick, parents must provide care. The study showed that 29% of such parents left work at least once a month to attend to sick children. This led to a loss of income and at times to job loss. Moreover, even children who are not themselves HIV infected are deeply affected by the disease when their parents become sick or when their parents have to care for others who are sick. HIV AIDS caregiving, much of which is done by women, 
affects the ability of those parents to provide routine care for the children who are not infected. So as I claim in the book, all of this in its messy, bloody, exhausting, relentless reality is the permanent background to the heavyweight moral and political issues related to globalization, human rights, and security, human security. The widely recognized uh, aspects of human security, freedom from poverty, food security, health care, protection from disease, physical safety from violence, uh, all of these things cannot be realized in the absence of robust, equitable, well-resourced relations and networks of care at the household, community, and state level, and at the transnational level. Moreover, none of these goods are achieved or enjoyed by individuals in isolation from others and the networks of care and support they provide. Relations and networks of care, for example, determine responsibilities, um, as I said this already, uh, determine responsibilities for how food is prepared and distributed within households. Access to health care depends upon prior commitments to ensure adequate care. Um, okay. Uh, uh, the trajectory of the global political economy uh, for the last uh, several decades has been driven by the devaluation, feminization, and privatization of caring services. Most recently, globalization has been literally supported by the transnationalization of caring and intimate labor. I argue that this context has not and cannot be one in which adequate levels of human security uh, can be achieved or sustained. So to conclude, um, I would say that considering human security through the lens of critical care ethics would focus our attention in different ways. The approach would demand greater attention to the particular contexts in which people are experiencing insecurity. Who, which humans are experiencing insecurity? How does the relational context of their lives affect the nature of their insecurity? What combination of resources, services, and time, time to care, will help achieve more secure households and communities? How does the wider socioeconomic context at the national and global level work either with or against the goal of creating a sense of security among people in the context of their relationships and communities? This context, as I've said, includes existing cultural norms on gender relations, as well as on race, as well as existing political culture on the legitimacy of care and the balance of the role of the state and private institutions, including the household, in providing that care. I think I'll just end there. <laughs>